do, do you need a couple of days more to prepare, uh, give it a good facelift and then you submit a good one? I think one person wanted uh, to a couple of days. Can I, can I give you one more week? Can you submit it by 10th, everyone? Okay, sir. So that everyone is on the one, on the same wavelength. Yeah. And everyone can make a fine tune and improve further add on few if you need to. Now, one other thing I want to tell you is that uh, the 3000 plus or minus 10% uh, word count, I'm very liberal on that. <clears throat> if you have valid points, you, you may include uh, immaterial of the word count. But uh, please see that uh, un unknown wanted unnecessary stuff are not in. Just make a good um, summarized form. So we will expect um, the submission by the 10th. That is uh, not tomorrow, Wednesday, next Wednesday. Everybody comfortable? Yes, sir. Good. Good, good. So that's super. Anyway, I have received only two or three drafts and I responded to them. Others also, please uh, send me your drafts. I can add some comments and send it back to you. Okay, that's one thing. The second logistical issue that I want to discuss with you, the evaluation criteria for this course had been the, these type of assignments that you submit and the MCQ questions that uh, with each semester that you answer and the final exam. So now, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, semester one and two, we had only one exam. I think uh, they have uh, <clears throat> all have scored good marks, except for two who had, who are just below the 50% mark, just below 50% mark. So me, myself and the Institute uh, think that with the averaging of the assignment marks, you might go over the 50% mark on marks. Even those two who have scored uh, little less than 50%. And going forward, now we will be, we are covering, we are on the third semester. Most likely within this week or next week, we will be completing the third semester and then we are walking into the fourth semester thereafter. And uh, there is, uh, because the government relaxation of the health guidelines, there is possibility that you all could again come to the institute and answer question papers. So I discussed with your seniors and also with the Institute and suggested that we will have one more MCQ question paper covering the areas covered in the third semester and the fourth semester. And there will be a final exam. There'll be a final examination, which will not be a MCQ question paper. It will be a essay type answer script, answer 
answering question paper uh, with about five to seven questions given out of which you have to answer about five questions. I, I will further discuss the structure with the Institute, but at least three to five questions you may have to answer. <clears throat> you will have a choice and uh, that will be not be a MCQ, not tactic talk. You, you will have to write a few paragraphs for each question as your answer because we are our constant endeavor is to upgrade the course <clears throat> as you know this particular course this year compared to the previous uh, four or five courses that we have delivered it, is uh, this year is very rich in the content because it was delivered online and also due to the fact that you are not have not been disturbing me or with questions <laughs> i don't know if this is a good thing or bad thing now when we met physically at the institute of bankers for the previous occasions at least there were a few questions from one or two and then also there, there was time to crack a joke and then share some harmony. So it was uh, the content this time because of it is it was online delivery had been enriched. So thereby it is enhanced, the standardized or the standard of the course have been upgraded. So what I suggested was, I discussed with your seniors and then also suggested to the Institute is that uh, whilst having one more MCQ paper covering third and fourth semester, that after final examination will be a essay type answer question paper. Because I understood most, most of you are, almost all of you have a, a, a set for the advanced level and you have the experience. And some of you are also following other courses. Some of you are following other courses. So that you have the experience of answering essay type question papers yourselves. So the essay type questions also will be covering the all the semesters, semester one, two, three, four. And now that you have a lot of material with you, you may have to go through the material and then equip yourselves, brush up your knowledge. All right. Any comment on this? Any comment? Do you like one, uh, one more MCQ paper and the final examination essay type question paper? You like it? If it is MCQ, we prepare, professor. You have the final examination? Uh, if it is possible. <laughs> you know, uh, as I said, uh, we are trying to constantly improve the standard of the course because this has been the, uh, this is recognized by the central bank as the certification course for the money brokering fraternity. So there should be uh, some standard maintained uh, and then uh, constantly upgraded. Why do you find it uh, difficult to write a few sentences on, on answer script 
as answer is it difficult please please uh, talk if you have any difficulty in answer, writing a few sentences for a question ideally we should have yes they look apologies sir i we uh, we joined rather late i just want to understand uh, you mentioned that it's a it's more of a written uh, kind of uh, structure right the paper yeah yeah i'll repeat i'll repeat so uh, hello so first of all we look uh, we uh, we uh, i extended the submission date for the five months uh, to the end. Sorry, sorry, sir. Uh, it's good uh, noisy in the in the market. Can I just understand? Repeat it again. When's the extension date? Now, assignment was due for submission tomorrow. Third, it was yes, extended extended till ten next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Okay. All right, sir. Okay. That's one. Second thing. Right. I was yes. mentioning that. Uh, now we had the MCQ test for the first and second semester. Yes, sir. And uh, third semester we are on now. It will conclude in about a uh, week's time. Then we are right, working to the semester. Yeah. We can we can have one more MCQ test paper exam covering the third and fourth semesters. Mm -hmm. Then Final examination I was proposing to have a essay type question paper. Essay type question paper to answer about three to five questions. Not much, three to five questions. So this will cover the whole course, if I'm not mistaken. The essay type question will cover the whole course, that's right. If if you don't mind me asking, can I know the weightage you will be providing for it or is that something that you let me decide? The weightage, uh, the, as I originally decided, the examination, the assignments will carry uh, how much? Uh, uh, we said 50%, right? For assignments? I, I can remember, I can recollect. 50% for MCQ, right? That's how the format was, no, sir? Yeah, yes. So it, uh, the MCQ papers. Yeah. And the uh, written uh, essay type question paper all will carry 50%. Right, sir. And the assignments will carry 50%. So the weightage will be the same. So 50%, is it? The written exam? Yeah, weightage will be the same. Correct. Will be so if you have an assignment, we will have a written paper, is it? Uh, yeah, now. You, you did three assignments with this, no? with the yes, yes. And the fourth year, instead of the assignment, for fourth semester, instead of the assignment, you will answer only uh, the final examination as I sit at question paper. Okay, okay, okay. Hello. Okay, sir. Understood. Now it's clear. Right? Because uh, the reason, uh, Niluk, what I suggested is that. We are yeah. certainly thinking think of upgrading the course because of the fact that Central Bank is recognizing this course as the certification course for your working community. Right. I assume this this is a new format. No, sir. Yeah. No. Uh, after agreeing with you all, I have to write to uh, send a paper to the institute bankers to uh, put that in the proper perspective. That is the reason why, okay. after discussing with your seniors, yeah, I I just uh, wanted to have a chat with you all as well. Sure, 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 sir. I think. Uh, I mean, if it's listed by the by the examinations board, I think 
that's something that we'll have to adhere to, no? Yes, that's right. You know, then over time, I think we, we need to upgrade this, you know, you know? Yes, sir. I understand. Now, this year, the, uh, delivering this course, the content has been very much high. The enrichment uh, has been very much higher than the previous years. We are we meeting physically and then we have little uh, time limitations in uh, discussing the full content. But this year, the content has been very high. Understood, understood. So, uh, I mean, you, yeah, obviously, if, if, if the examination board, in my personal opinion, I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf yes. of anyone. Uh, yeah. I mean, if, if the examination board has decided to uh, implement a particular format, I guess we we really don't have much of a say in it, right? It's, it's no, we have been uh, conducting this very on a friendly, uh, very, very democratic manner so far. Yes, All sir. the five or six courses that we delivered uh, uh, coming from the year 2010, I guess. Yes. Uh, we have been very democratic. We have been speaking to the participants. We have been speaking to the heads of your companies. Yes, sir. And then uh, structuring it in a in a more friendly manner to, to make it win win situation for everyone. Understood. So, if you are if you are asking for uh, like uh, like my personal opinion, I would say obviously the MCQ is preferred. But uh, uh, I mean, if, if the written examination is a requirement, I I, I personally don't uh, see an issue with that. But the preference is obviously to uh, mul multiple tries. If you are asking me my personal preference, sir. Ah, that is for convenience sake. Uh, somewhat, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think one other person, I think Kassapa, somebody said that if it is an MCQ, it is better. Yeah. I'm looking at on a, on a more uh, comprehensive and then more wholesome way yeah. to, to show the regulator, central bank, and your company heads, your seniors particularly that uh, this this course is of some value understood sir understood i just thought i'll express my personal opinion in case yeah thank you very much you thank you thank you for that and thank, thank you Niluk, and thank you kasaba for expressing your ideas so for the moment uh, i take it as uh, because uh, i got two comments out of 16 students uh, thank you very much for that. But uh, however, for the moment, can we agree that uh, going forward, now your assignment to be submitted on the 10th, one, step one, then I'll be preparing for a, a MCQ paper, either 30 questions or 50 questions, uh, covering third and fourth semesters. Then I'll be preparing for a essay type question paper covering semesters one, two, three, four. So that's the summary for the moment. Okay, that is great. Uh, anybody, anybody else wants to express their opinion? Any comment by anybody else? No? Okay then, we will get on with the... Now on the... Tomorrow there is class and then uh, fourth... You are working or you are on holiday? Fourth holiday, sir. Okay, on leave, sir. sir. We will not have classes on the fourth. Uh, and by next week, we will be completing the th semester three and we'll be starting on the semester four. Uh, because by now, 
some with some of the presentations we have covered the some aspects of semester 4 as well because uh, we were enriching the stuff to the presentations as much as possible all right so we will resume the presentation of the class discussion I think the last week uh, we came out to this slide after discussing the treasury bills and treasury bonds, the few examples of calculations, and we stopped at mark to market uh, slide. How many of you have uh, experience of market to market uh, of portfolios? Have you got any experience? It is an accounting accountancy accounting process of comparing or recording the price of value, price or value of a security portfolio or an account. Basically, if you express in Two, three words, it's uh, comparing the current market price against the purchase price. And the difference given as a gain or loss. Obviously, when the purchase price was recorded as 100, and if the current, mar current market price is if it is 105, then 105 minus 100, 5 rupees is a gain. On the other hand, if the purchase price was 100 and if the current market price is 97, 97 minus 100 is minus 3, a mark to market loss. So, this is common to treasury bills, treasury bonds, foreign exchange, portfolios, or both those whole situations, currency wise. And this marking to market is a concept that is mandated by the Institute of Chartered Accountants and uh, regulators to evaluate, to measure the profit or loss situation or the gain and loss profiles of each and every account, each and every instrument. And as we discussed uh, last two or three classes, the portfolios usually are held to maturity available for sale and held for trading and we, we discussed that held to maturity and available for sale mark to market results the gains or losses are accounted in the balance sheet not in the PNL the held for trading portfolio, mark to market gain or mark to market loss is accounted in the profit and loss statement or income statement. The difference being that all the securities, all the other instruments which are under L2 maturity and available for, available for sale are bought for the purpose of securing the coupon income and maturity proceeds income. Therefore, they are not considered as 
trading portfolios the trading portfolio has to go through the help for trading business model or the category and most of the banks and primary dealers score or show their colors so their skill in the short term trading by recording capital gains or exchange profits in the help for trading portfolio for which they are recognized by way of performance bonuses extra bonuses and other con uh, other encouragements offered by the management for their contribution so therefore it is market to market is a endeavor or process to reflect its current market value rather than its book value is a constant effort in the in the context of bookkeeping as at the end of every accounting period maybe every week or every month every quarter every half year every end of the year it is an effort to reflect the current market value of the portfolio rather than it is book value book value means historical purchase price when you do that the unsatisfactory situations are brought or highlighted by way of recording the capital losses or Uh, mark to market losses then as per the accountancy principles those loss making situations are routed through the final accounts in the case of health health for trading they are routed through the profit and loss account and shown as a financial financial results to reflect the market value of the portfolio so that the shareholders and any other investors or the public is aware of the value of the portfolios and the value of the company and this helps the shareholders existing shareholders or any new prospective shareholder who would want to buy the shares of the company if they are listed by looking at the portfolios the loss making situation or the profit making situation and in the case of existing shareholders if they were wish to exit by selling or in the case of a new shareholder who's looking at this company share to invest more in the company share this is a good indicator so market to market process has to happen in case of each and every portfolio maintained by the financial institutions this has become a mandatory audit requirement okay so then we were discussing about the swift connectivity and the swift connection had been used in sri lanka particularly to serve in the 
real time cross settlement system and the scriptless settlement security settlement system uh, as a as a message com communicator or messaging platform as you can see in this diagram the central bank computers are here at the bottom and the participating institutions swift interfaces are at the top and the connectivity shown in the in the middle for the rtg system the participating institutions with the commercial banks or primary dealers are connected through swift fin finnis finance swift fin y copy when you say y copy it is to reflect the fact that from one bank or primary dealer message is sent to the central bank computer and it checks the availability of funds in the in the respective central bank account of that entity and if that money availability confirms only the message is processed thereafter and then it goes to the fact that the the money reserved or debited to that account and the beneficiary account the other commercial bank or the primary dealer beneficiary account is credited and then it is communicated to the next or the beneficiary commercial bank or the primary dealer because of that it is called y copy so this have been this message carrier is swift so this arrangement have been we have experienced since 2002 so it has served us since then in a very comprehensive and successful manner then scriptless security settlement system communicating the treasury bill or treasury bond scriptless form debit and credit to the respective cds accounts of the commercial banks or the primary dealers again the message carry is swift and there here the involvement of central deposit system or computer of the public debt department to debit the amount of treasury bills or treasury bonds in respect of the the commercial bank or the primary dealers cds account and the balances on that account can be waived by the commercial bank or the primary dealer through the browser interface provided by the cbsl net the browser interface in the office of the primary dealer or the commercial bank will reflect the central bank computers cds status giving the balances of treasury bills and treasury bonds held on their own behalf on their own behalf of the commercial bank or primary dealer to explain to you the lanka settle and the lanka secure lanka settle is the total scenario lanka secure is this previous scenario covering the scriptless security settlement system and the cds system uh, cds system which can be waived through the cbsl net by each participant 
Okay. So the scriptless security settlement system uh, functions of a Lanka uh, that generic name given to this system is Lanka Secure. So the functions of that system is issue of scriptless securities in electronic form. I can remember prior to 2002, we had to collect the man manually printed treasury bills like in the case of fixed deposit receipt issued by banks currently. And on the reverse, there was places for endorsement. Each time the treasury bill sold, the seller has to endorse and transfer. And finally, on the maturity date, two days prior to maturity, maturity is always fell on Fridays, but by about Wednesday, two days prior to that Friday, we had to collect all those certificates in bundles and bundles, endorse them, and a separate person has to carry them to the public department of Central Bank Sri Lanka. And the worst part was that on the maturity day, Friday, Central Bank Public Debt Department was unable to process all the certificates submitted to them because of the manual workload. And it eventually happened that at least next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, only the funds were credited to the account on maturity proceeds. So that, that, that cumbersome difficulty we underwent prior to the Lanka system or the SSS system was implemented in 2003. Then scriptless electronic form of account maintenance of treasury bills is very much convenient now. On Friday itself, the maturity proceeds are credited to the accounts and then there is no necessity of manual endorsement of the certificates because it is scriptless. Then maintenance of central record of ownership of scriptless securities, the CDS, central deposit system, is very convenient. Payment of interest and maturity proceeds to the participants. It is all almost made automatic. And uh, you may have the experience this, if you have bought treasury bills or bonds for your own account, you will receive a statement from the central bank CDS. I think every six months they print a certificate or on and yes, mail them to you or sometimes you, they, they send you by email the, to inform you the status of your holding of treasury bills and bonds according to the records of the CDS and the market value of that. Then settlement of securities traded on delivery versus payment or receive versus payment on basis is also recorded in the CDS and when the money payment is involved, it is connected to the RTGS. Then the transfer of securities between accounts, deliver free and receive free, is also recorded. And if they are particularly communicated in the proper accepted message formats, International Securities uh, Identification Number, ISIN number, is very much needed to identify these type of securities when they are in a scriptless form. IS or ISIN number is of 12 characters in length.
LK is to indicate that it is denominated in rupees. And here the year, month and date. And the balance boxes are used to insert or populate the security type. Security type, I'll explain it in the next slide. And the duration. I'll explain again in the next slide. And the maturity date, year, month and the date. And there is another last digit, last box, meant for check digit. It's for confidentiality sake, a check digit is inserted. And the security type, the third box here, is A usually used for treasury bills, B usually used for treasury bonds with coupons, C treasury bonds without coupons, that is zero coupon bonds, then D is for central bank securities, E for inflationary inflation linked bonds. So that is on the security type. Then duration for three month treasury bills, 91 days, 091. Six months, 182 days, 182. One year treasury bills, 364 days, 364. Then two year bonds, 002, three year 003, 10 year 010, and 30 year 0, like that. So, Duration is usually expressed in three boxes as given in slide here. Then this message type or MT, message type or denoted by MT, 500 series is dedicated for securities type of messages. 540 has to be sent to request the central bank CDS to receive free. And when one counterparty, first counterparty sends a receive free, second counterparty has to send a deliver free message. Deliver free, meaning the CDS account of the Second counterparty has to be debited and the CDS account of the first counterparty has to be credited. So these two message types has to match exactly. Central bank computers do the reconciliation and connect the MT540 received from the first counterparty with the MT542 received from the second counterparty and the respective accounts are debited and credited. Then MT541, first counterparty sensor receive against payment. And second counterparty sensor message 543 deliver was against payment. So the second counterparty's account, CDS account is debited. And the first counterparty's CDS account is credited. Payment First counterparty's RTGS account is debited and second counterparty's RTG account is credited. So these two type of messages received independently by the central bank computers has to connect and exactly match. Then only the transaction will go through the, the central bank computers. So likewise, the receive free confirmation, receive against payment messages also are available under the tag of 543, MT543 and MT545. <coughs> so, this 
information, I think it's going to be very valuable when you are involved in a transaction of treasury bills and treasury bonds, CB cell securities, and such transactions. Okay, that presentation is over. I'll switch on to the next presentation. Next presentation is uh, on uh, foreign exchange forwards. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Good, good. This is going to be on the foreign exchange forward contracts and a little bit uh, discussion on the forward points or swap points that you normally use in your day-to-day -day business. <clears throat> um, now in the market, spot transactions are not seen at all, isn't it? You see most of the forward transactions, almost all. So that is because of the situations. However, in our days, a couple of decades ago, spot marketers were the very vibrant market. And even the forwards up to six months and up to occasionally up to one year transaction was seen. And we have more often concluded one million or two million or a couple of million dollar <clears throat> transactions. However, due to the precarious situation of the economy, things are dried down. However, the principal knowledge has to be with the money brokers when to involve the, the transactions. So the forward forex market operations in liquidity management and hedging risk. I thought of discussing with you the definition of the forward contract forward transaction. It's a firm and binding contract between whether it's a customer, a retail customer and the bank or between two banks, it's the same. Between the customer and the bank or between two banks for the purchase or sale of a spe specified sum of foreign currency at a rate of exchange fixed at the time of establishing the contract for performance or delivery by payment at an agreed date in the future. So this is a elaborated definition of this forward contract. <clears throat> this is to say that it is it is legally enforceable. It's a legally enforceable contract. In a court of law, the source documents or the confirmations has to be shown to prove. I have also, I have also experienced when there was stamp duty payable on these confirmations we had to have a stock of postage stamps and then fix on each of this confirmation and cancel it to make it legal. But 
some time ago, the stamp duty requirement was taken out. So therefore, they, uh, keeping a stock of st postage stamps were not necessary thereafter. So this is to express how important the confirmation is because of the fact that the forward exchange contracts are legally enforceable contract and that to make it legally viable, presentable in a court of law, legal court of law, the it has to the confirmation has to be prepared and signed accordingly so that it can be legal evidence. So why forward exchange contract? Why forward exchange? To hedge against exchange fluctuations, to ascertain what the exact cost will be for any trader or for any customer, a forward exchange contract will help him to ascertain what the exact cost will be of the goods bought or sold. To mobilize sufficient funds on a future date when the payment obligations arises. <clears throat> When involved involving of exchange rate, quite uncertain if, if it is not booked or contracted, <coughs> then the payment obligation cannot be really estimated to the near, nearest rupee or nearest uh, amount. But the forward exchange contract helps the estimated, not estimated, helps us to calculate and know the exact amount to be paid on the future date as the trade transaction requires. If the settlement is to be on a specified future date, the deal is a fixed forward contract. Now, this fixed forward contract and other thing is the option forward contract is not normally used between banks, <coughs> but bet with, between the customers and the banks, it is very well, very often used. Almost all the time it is used. So when you know the exact date of the delivery or the settlement, you can make a fixed forward contract. Now, between banks are all fixed forward contracts. Between by a bank A will sell dollars, bank B will buy dollars, and there is an exact delivery date. So it's fixed forward contract. So between customers, on the contrary, banks and customers, making a fixed forward contract is a big disadvantage to the customer. Why? <clears throat> because of his arrangements to go through the shipping procedures and obtaining the documents connected, you cannot really target a fixed date so therefore, an option forward contract was evolved. If the settlement is to be between two specified dates, one of which might be the day of the deal is done. The deal is an option forward contract. You can have one month forward contract with last week option. If you establish a contract on the 1st of January for one month, that is 31st of, 1st of January means uh, spot date is 3rd of January. 
then the 3rd of February is the end date of the fault contract and option if it is option one week option three weeks fix and one week option option maybe 25th of January to 3rd of February it is option period so up to 25th of January it is fixed period basically <clears throat> The bank has to be prepared in the case of an export customer to buy his export proceeds from the 25th of January till 3rd of February. In the case of import customer, bank has to be prepared to deliver the funds, foreign currency funds, from 25th of January to 3rd of February. So this option periods, period is really helping out with the, with the operational procedures to be completed by the customer. So because there is no operational matters and then procedures involved between banks when there's a forward exchange contract, the fixed forward date, one single date, is possible but when it comes to the trade international trade transaction and the customers importing and exporting and various other type of foreign remittances and then involvement there has to be an option period this option period can be from the 1st of january itself till 3rd of february whole month, option, whole, whole period can be option period as well. Then if you expand or extend the option period from one week to one month that to cover the entire period, the customer is at a very big disadvantage. Of course, he will have the luxury of option to use the contract any day during the option period. However, the benefit of the premium or a discount cannot be passed on to the customer by the bank because the bank has to be prepared to accommodate the customer during the whole period of the option. So therefore, economically or profit-wise, or rupees and cents wise, it is better for the customer to request a forward contract with the narrowest possible option period so that he can be benefited by way of maximum premium or maximum discount that he, for him to uh, make this transaction more profitable for him. In an option contract between the customer and the bank, the option always lies with the customer. The option is for the customer to choose the delivery date, either to buy foreign exchange or sell foreign exchange. He has to call on the bank during the option period. So, the option is always with the customer. He can choose either on the 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 31st, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, any date. He can request the bank to either deliver the foreign currency or buy the foreign currency as the contract specifies. So that option period is usually to benefit the customer. So as we discussed before, narrow the option period, the customer benefits by way of rupees and cents. The option simply relate to the delivery of the currency and not on 
any power of the customer to refuse the contract. The contract must be completed. Remember the first slide we said it's a legally binding contract. So currency delivery has to happen. Settlement has to happen. But the option simply relates to the date of the delivery. Selection of the date of the delivery. So option period is to specify the, the period in which the customer is going to use the contract. The forward option was introduced to provide more elasticity to the commercial trader. To the commercial trader, the option period was introduced to provide more elasticity. Limiting of the option to part of the period may enable the bankers to quote a better rate for the customer. Because bank has to always expect the worst case scenario when the customer calls upon after having booked a forward contract, forward option contract, that he would either come on the first day of the option period or he might come on the last day of the option period. So any day during the period of the option, bank has to be prepared to deliver the funds or receive the funds, foreign currency funds, from the customer in the case of delivery premium if the currency is at a premium then if the after having given premium for the full contract covering the option period if the customer requests the payment on the first day of the option having given the full period premium then the bank is losing so therefore, the premium will be passed only. Pa premium will be passed on to the customer only for the period of the fixed period. First day of the option period, the customer can ask for the currency. So therefore, premiums are not taken into consideration when the calculation is done for the customer contract. So any unused portion has to be cancelled by close out. Say if the forward exchange contract was for $200,000 and if the customer has used only $190,000, the balance $10,000 has to be cancelled. There is a process of cancelling. If it is if it's the import contract, customer has to for the customer to buy the $200,000 from the bank, and the bank agrees to sell at the forward rate. And eventually his shipment covered only $190,000, $10,000 in excess, the forward contract, that $10,000 in excess in the forward contract has to be closed out. Meaning technically, bank will presume that $10,000 balance is sold to the bank, sold to the customer at the contracted rate and the bank buying the $10,000 back to the bank at the prevailing spot rate. So the contracted rate, forward contracted rate selling and the buying at the prevailing spot rate. The difference is usually debited to the customer account. Usually debited to the customer account. So that, that is the process of closing out. Process of closing out. So there's a small exercise to prove the relationship between interest and exchange rates.
just a small scenario to be discussed. I want to, to follow it and then if possible, use a calculator and then do the little bit calculation to see the connection between the interest rates and the exchange rates. You will understand very much better on a very simple method, on a very simple form, how the premiums are or discounts are arrived at using the interest rate of the currencies. Assume the following interest and exchange rates. Six months, euro dollars, 2%. Now, don't get put up with the word euro. Now, euro is a currency, all right. But the term euro had been used from decades, decades ago to show that the currency, dollar, when it is used outside the jurisdiction of US, it is called Euro. Now, when, when if our rupee, Sri Lankan rupee, if it is used outside the jurisdiction of Sri Lanka, it is Euro rupee. When the sterling pounds is used outside the jurisdiction of UK, it is Euro pound. So, for the moment, you can just for your knowledge, but ignore the word euro here. Six month dollars at 2% interest rate per annum and six month rupees at 8% per annum. Spot dollar rupee rate 202. Just the prevailing rate. And uh, a Sri Lankan customer wants to buy $1 million against LKR six months forward from the bank. Customer needs to buy six months forward $1 million. Usually a customer will have rupees, right? So, but this particular customer may be to fund an import. He wants to buy a million dollar from the bank, from his bank to finance, to pay for his import in six months time. Supposing if there is no market for six months, we are required to calculate the six months forward rate, exchange rate. So this process we follow. If there were no forward market in order to determine a price, the bank would proceed as follows. Uh, so if there were no forward market, and the bank would proceed as the one, two, three, four steps. This is only to arrive at the forward rate, forward exchange rate. Bank borrows 202 million for a period of six months at 8% because six month rate of 8% for rupees. Bank borrowed 202 million at 8% for six months. Then sell that 202 million in the spot market and buy dollars. Because the spot rate was 202, that 202 million rupees is sold and then buy $1 million. Invest that $1 million bought for a period of six months at the rate of 2%. So 2% is the dollar interest rate. Assuming no change in the spot rate over the six month period, assuming that there is no change from the spot, from the spot rate for the rest of the six month period, the assumption, the bank would sell the interest earned in the dollars because bank invested the $1 million for six months. That interest earned, bank would sell the interest earned on the dollar investment against rupees, resulting in only $1 million being available 
in the six months time. So we'll plot that on the two respective cash flows. The left hand side gives you the rupee cash flow, right hand side gives you the dollar cash flow. Transaction number one, you borrowed 202 million, it's a plus. And then on the same day, you sold that 202 million to buy dollar. And uh, it's a minus on the rupee cash flow and $1 million plus on the dollar cash flow. Then as the third step, you invested that $1 million at 2% with another bank. So minus $1 million. So for, so for the day one, both rupee cash flows and dollar cash flows are covered. Plus and minus, there's no balance. Then when you come to the six months date, 180 days, 180th day or 182nd day or whatever, you have to pay that 202 million and the interest at 8% and it's a minus of the cash flow. You can calculate in your, using your calculator, 8% on 202 million, 8% of 202 million is 8 million and 80,000. So total of, total of 210 million and 80,000 interest payment out minus. Then on the step three, you invested $1 million at the rate of 2% 2, 2 and uh, for the, at the rate of 2% for six months, interest earning is 10,000. So you will see 1 million and 10,000. And out of that, 10,000 is sold. Remember the spot rate is now not changed to one or two. And you receive 2 million and 20,000 rupees, the rupee cash flow. So now when you cover up, when you aggregate the, both the cash flows, the dollar cash flow is left with $1 million to be given to the customer on the 180th day. On the rupee cash flow, you have paid out 210,000, and you have received 2,020,000. So now you are left with 208,060,000 minus on the rupee cash flow. So this brings up us and tells us that a good picture, the $1 million in six months time is worth or equal to 208,060,000 in rupee terms. So basically, where $1 million was worth 202 million on the day one, on the day 180, $1 million is used, is equal to to only 8 million and 60,000. So that's the forward rate. In other words, $1 is equal to 208 rupees and 60, uh, 6 cents. So this is a simple example or simple scenario to explain the relationship between the interest rate and the exchange rate with no profit, no additional hidden profits for the bank or for the customer. But in the real world, the demand and supply happens, influences the rate. So therefore, this is to explain, the cash flow show that after 180 days, the bank has $1 million available for the customer against the requirement of 208 million rupees and 60,000, which could constitute the cost to the customer of the forward $1 million. Assuming no spread for the bank, the forward exchange rate would be $1 equals 208 rupees and 6 cents. But the, usually the bank also marks up a profit margin. And in the market, 
due to demand and supply. This is the exact relationship between the two currencies. Uh, moves either way to the side of the demand. When the demand is high and to the side of supply when the supply is high. The difference between the spot rate and the forward rate of 6 rupees and 6 cents. How 6 rupees and 6 cents came? Spot date, the rate was 202. The forward 6 month date, the rate was 208.06. So the difference is 6.06. The forward rate, the difference between the spot rate and the forward rate is called the premium or the swap points. How did that come about? Because of the interest rate differential between 8% and 2%. 8%, 8% and 2% interest rate differential adjusted for the time has resulted in 6 rupees and 06 cents and it is called premium. Why? Why it is called premium? It is called premium because the spot rate was 202 and 6 month forward rate is 208.06 is more expensive in the premium, in the, in the forward date. Dollar is at a premium because the, the forward rate is higher. And this 6 rupees and 6, 06 cents is also called, called the swap point. So without going through those three or four steps of explanation, you could compute the premium or discount because it's a function of the interest differential between the two currencies adjusted for time. We can compute it using a simple formula as given in the slide. Spot rate multiplied by the interest rate differential. 8 minus 2 is 6. Multiply that by the time or the number of days. For 6 months is 180 days we are taken. And divided by 360. Why 360? Because it is the, it is the calculation is for US dollar. US dollar. So US dollar day count basis is 360. 360 and into 100. Why? Because we use 6% here and percentage to get rid of the percentage, you have to multiply by 100 here. So you get the exact 6.06 .06 number. The, I use the long method of going step by step just to give you a good understanding how this premium has come about. The forward rate known as the outright rate Therefore, is 202 spot rate because it's a premium plus or added six months premium, 6.06. .06. And the forward rate is 208.06, which you got through the four, three or four steps that we followed exactly. To be to, to express the six months forward rate. So I hope you got a fair idea of how the premium or the swap points constitute. This vary the forward rate and the swap points may vary because of excess demand or excess supply. Excess demand or excess supply, as we see in the market. Now, because of the exporters not converting the export proceeds in time, expecting the rupee to depreciate further or dollar to appreciate further, and the importers running 
to the banks to buy dollars for their imports, demanding dollars, uh, making a big demand than usual. So the, because of this, there is a concentrated demand for the foreign currency and therefore chain rate depreciation happens, the forward rate happens. So therefore, the actual interest rate differential decided premium might vary because of the excess demand or excess supply. So how do we know whether to add or subtract the swap points in which case 606 points in this case 606 points from the spot rate. General rule is that higher the interest rate currency is always at a discount for forward value all things remaining equal. Now in the case of dollar and the rupee dollar interest rate was 2 and the rupee interest rate is 8. So we were con considering the value of the dollar which gives only 2% interest compared to the rupee 8%. So it's at a premium. It's at a premium. If the dollar interest rate were 8% and the rupee interest rate was 2% then it would have been at a discount. So points need to be subtracted. But here in this real example, dollar interest rate we took as 2% and the rupee interest rate we took as 8%. So therefore it is at a premium. So it has to be added on. But of course, taking all other things remaining equal. Therefore, if the US dollar cost 202 for the spot value, it must be expensive for forward value in view of its lower interest rate relative to LKR. It will be expensive if it costs more than 202 rupees. Accordingly, we add the swap points to the spot rate. That is why it is called premium. I hope you understood the calculating part and then composition of the swap points uh, or the premiums or discounts. I'll come to the today's real scenario premiums and discounts after a few slides. After explaining the factors affecting the exchange rate or value of a currency associated with supply and demand for the currency. When supply and demand are in equilibrium, then exchange rates are stable. Just imagine if our imports and exports were equal in value and we received the exchange uh, proceeds of the do dollar proceeds of the exports in time and the importers didn't demand for higher value of Im imports to finance imports for in exchange from the banks and if supposing they, they were equal the spot rate and the forward rates will be the, the same will be equal. There won't be any volatility of the exchange rate and it will be equal. It will be at equilibrium. So what does actually change the value of exchange rate or value of currencies? One, balance of payment. 
determined by the balance of trade and invisible earnings. What are these balance of trade? The difference between the value of goods exported and the value of goods imported is the balance of trade. And what are the invisible earnings? <clears throat> invisible earning, earnings are the loans obtained by the government and grants and then also we can take the inward remittances by the worker remittances they are also invisible earnings so all depends on the receipts of foreign currency and payment of foreign currency between countries and the national accounts reflecting the imposed exports and invisible earnings is called balance of payment. If a country has to pay money out to other countries more than it receives, then the balance of payment is in deficit or shortfall like in the case of Sri Lanka. If the balance of payment, the goods imported and then exported and the initial earnings received, received are more than the expenses made, paid out, then there is a balance of payment surplus. So balance of same payment surplus meaning there is a strong balance of trade and will make the currency strong. Why? When there is more foreign exchange received by the country, when there is more foreign exchange received by the country, there will be a demand for rupees to convert those foreign exchange received to rupees. <clears throat> we experienced this scenario in the year 2004, December, after the tsunami. There were a lot of aid flowing into the government and also the NGOs and individuals from foreign organizations and individuals. And the Sri Lankan government debt payment was stopped for a while and therefore country received huge amount of inflow of foreign currency and the outflow was more or less stopped. So there was more demand for rupees with the heavy influx of foreign currency and the rupee appreciated by a certain amount, I can remember it's about three or four, five rupees appreciation in that period. I think the rupee level, dollar rupee level, those days in 2004 was about 103, 104, like that. So at the same time, a poor balance of trade may adversely affect the exchange rate, meaning when there is more outflow of foreign exchange and less inflow of foreign exchange, there will be always demand for the foreign currency and excess supply of rupees and the exchange rate will depreciate. So balance of payment is a big contributor to the value of the local currency. You can have a good example of Sri Lanka rupee where always there had been a demand for foreign exchange and supplying rupees to the banking system asking for foreign exchange to finance the heavy imports 
that's the reason why this present government had to stop import of luxury goods including motor vehicles to curtail imports expenses to curtail import expenses interest rate is another contributive factor to the action rate movements high interest rates might attract investments from countries where there are lower interest rates thereby affecting the exchange rate if other factors like political situation peace harmony and other contributory factor factors exchange control regulations when they are disregarded when the local currency is at when the local currency investments are earning high return there can be foreign investments into the country from the countries where there is a lower interest rate paid on their deposits or on their investments because people will like more income they will shift their funds investments to the high interest rate countries to earn high income so we have seen very often when the interest rates are increased the changes to the exchange rate and the macroeconomic variables at the same time when the interest rates are reduced the other way can happen the investments can flow out to other countries which pay high interest rates rate of inflation the price of goods in countries of high inflation will rise and will be more expensive for importers when there is a higher inflation the when the price levels increase is very high the importers of goods from that particular country will have to pay more demand for these goods will fall and demand for that currency will fall affecting the exchange rate the positive yield or the negative yield that is the real interest rate no nominal interest rate nominal interest rate minus the inflation is the real interest rate or real yield i guess you can re reflect on that you can understand very well when the interest rate is 8% and if the inflation rate is 7.6 the real interest rate or real yield is 8 minus 7.6 meaning 0.4 that is that is the only income left over after inflation because from the income the pr price levels of goods are risen by 7.6 7.6% i took 7.6% because the last october inflation published in sri lanka is 7.6 isn't it and its quantum will affect the exchange rate the real yield or real interest rate real income that is nominal interest rate minus inflation the real income the quantum of that will affect the exchange rate because no one will bring the investment to the country even if the interest rate is at 8 or 10% and if the inflation rate is 7% then net or the real income is 10 minus 7 3% other countries when the inflation is below 2% or below 3% they can afford to pay interest 
six percent or five percent, and then still maintain a real higher real return or higher real income. So therefore, the quantum of real income or real yield is materially important to maintain the exchange rate or exchange rate fluctuations. Confidence. The outcome of a general election may prompt investors to move their investments out or add to them or bring them the investment in if the after if after the general election if the confidence level is improving of course then there is, is a good for country good for economy but still if after the elections if the people government coming to power if there's no confidence in the government or the set of people who govern then the people will move out for lack of confidence hot money large amount of speculative funds which flows into a country where the exchange rate is likely to appreciate is called hot money. The large amount of money, the speculative, speculative nature, they come to grab the appreciating value of the currency or exchange rate and they can move out as quickly as they came in after taking their profits after reaching their targets they can move out so that type of money is called hot money and where the interest and other income is possible uh, hot money can flow out quickly as it came creating tremendous fluctuations in demand and supply of that currency. Good example is that 2008, uh, rather, 1998, eight, uh, Asian, East Asian currency turmoil. The hot money, huge volumes of hot money came into this few countries, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, few countries like that. And uh, when they were reaching the targeted profit levels, all the funds sold the assets and took the money away, leaving the countries in shackles because those economies couldn't handle the volumes that they moved out. So hot money is the uh, countries must be very extremely careful of the hot money coming in. They may come in as foreign direct investments, but the volumes, if they are large and then if they can be moved out very quickly, then those investments uh, will be sold when they move out. Leading and lagging, an action to maximize profits which will quicken the, or postpone supply and demand. This is exactly what I explained before, what we saw very recently also. The importers who were importing rice, milk powder, dal, and gas, and other commodities. They ordered and then imported stocks for, 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 for about three, four years, expecting the rupee to move up to 230 or 240 rupees from 198 to 190 rupees. 
that is called leading. The usual stock imported is probably stocks adequate to about one month to three months. But all of a sudden they decided because they thought that the rupee was going to depreciate to 230 or 200 rupees, they wanted to place orders and then import and then stock here, here to make make up profits when the exchange rate moves up to 230, 240. Because citing the exchange rate, they are going to increase their retail price. So that's process called leading. And lagging is expecting the rupee to move up to 230, 240. Exporters hoarded their export proceeds in dollar form in foreign banks and then foreign currency accounts without converting them to rupees. So that is lagging. Leading and lagging. So According to my understanding and my experience, Sri Lanka suffered from leading and lagging twice, I think, in the year 2001 or to the year 2000 and 2001. That particular period also the same process occurred, leading and lagging, when the rupee were, before rupee, rupee was floated, in January 2001 and during that period also the foreign currency reserves went to negative because the central bank was announcing the exchange rate on a daily basis for the US dollar buying and selling rate known, known, uh, which is known as crawling band and on a daily basis, dollar appreciated either 25 cents or 50 cents, sometimes one rupee and two rupees as well. So the same scenario occurred. The importers rushed to book forward and the exporters dragged their feet in converting the export proceeds to rupees. And therefore, I think it was the 23rd of January 2001, Settlement decided to stop quoting the exchange rate, dollar value, dollar buying and selling rates on a daily basis. And that they asked the banks to decide the dollar exchange rates uh, going by the market rate. So therefore, bankers, uh, bankers, uh, treasury dealers were left high and dry to start determination of the dollar value going by the market forces. Central bank intervention. Should there be undue pressure on currency then the central bank will enter the market as buyer or seller to restore equilibrium. Like what, what is happening these days, the central bank enters the market and then stabilizes the rupee value of the dollar at 202. So this is also There is uh, there's an impact on the exchange rate. Exchange controls, government control law regulations to control the outflow of funds from a country affect the supply of that currency. Exchange controls. Now exchange controls, we have good examples in Sri Lanka where they stopped import of vehicles and the luxury goods. And then also <clears throat> to import of when importing opening LCs, 100% cash margin, 
those tools were brought in. So therefore, the exchange controls also impact not only the outflow of foreign exchange, when there is exchange controls, the new inflows also will not come in because the investors will be careful in bringing their funds in because of fear of exchange controls when they want to take the money out. All right. So <clears throat> there are a few more slides. We'll discuss these slides tomorrow. So what we discuss today is the last or to discuss is the points that are being that are that have impact on the exchange control or the exchange rate of a country. I think this is a good question that might come on the final paper. So these points, if you study well, you might be able to answer a question on the final examination paper. All right, any question up now? No question? No, sir, not from me. Thank you, Niluk. Thank you. Anybody else? Any comment? No comment? Okay, then. We'll meet uh, at uh, 4 p.m. tomorrow.